Well, you excited to be in church today? Hey, how about that? We had over 100 baptisms just today, 100 baptisms. I love that because culture wants to tell you that the next generation is going to hell in a handbasket. It's what's wrong. Like 85% of the baptisms today were people 25 and under. We have a next generation that are standing bold on God's word. You know, baptisms is just a public funeral. It's just, I'm, my old life is dead. I'm no longer that person anymore. This is who I am now. And I love that. I love celebrating that. Uh, let me give you some context what we're gonna read. We're about to jump into the word, Genesis 19. Let me give you some context. We're gonna be reading about Sodom and Gomorrah. And for those of you that don't know, Sodom and Gomorrah was not just one of the most wicked cities. Sodom and Gomorrah was the most wicked city in all of the Bible. And in the, in the story that we're reading, God has given them opportunity after opportunity to turn back to him. That's what God does in his goodness. He offers opportunity after opportunity. That's what the Old Testament is. He sends uh, judge after judge, person after person, saying, turn to God, turn to God, turn to God. And then when they, when they don't, God in this story says, hey, you know what? I'm actually gonna destroy the city. But there is one righteous man, his name is Lot. So God in his goodness spares Lot in his family. He sends two angels to rescue Lot and this family from a city that's soon gonna be destroyed. And this is where we pick up in Genesis 19. It reads like this. It says, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he, everybody say this with me, but he lingered. Oh, I never wanna linger when God speaks to me. Whenever God tells me to do something, I never wanna linger. Something. I've heard my whole life growing up is the distance between knowing what God is asking you to do and you doing it measures your spiritual maturity. Maybe you're here today and God has spoken to you. Maybe you're a young person and God's spoken to you about a relationship and you know it's not right and you know God's called you to end it, but you've been lingering. Maybe you're here today and God has placed something on your heart to tell a coworker about Jesus or to start showing up different in your marriage, start speaking life over your spouse, but you've been lingering. Can I encourage you to be radically obedient uh, a few weeks ago, I was in my devotion time and I was, I was reading Matthew 5. And Matthew 5, it's the Beatitudes and it's Jesus speaking. And I've read it several times, but there's one Beatitude that I read, one of the things he said that just hit different with me. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And as someone who's experienced grief and loss, I thought that was just powerful, I kind of highlighted it, I just paused there. Just thinking about how awesome that is, that in the middle of mourning, in the middle of grief, God offers comfort. That's just powerful. And I left my Devo time and I, I went and got my kids ready for school and, and I put my son in the truck. And as soon as I got in the truck, the Lord placed the guy in my heart. And I, I just, I picked up the phone and called. I hadn't talked about months. I had no clue why I was calling. I just, just popped in my head. By the way, if something like that happens, that's not just a coincidence, that's a God incidence. That's God's leading. Just be obedient to that. I just picked up the phone and and I called, I said, yo, what's going on? He said, uh, it's actually wild that you called me today because today is the three year anniversary. Three years ago today, I lost my brother to substance abuse. And this is just like, I, I just in the morning, I'm just wrecked already. I said, okay, well, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I said, okay, well, did you know that in Matthew five, it actually says that those who mourn will experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Would you, could we just surrender this to God right now? I'll just begin to pray over him and he's crying and I'm just like, okay, this is God, I'm crying. And, Here's what I've noticed is, it seems that obedience is the door that breakthrough walks through. Just obedience to God's voice. If you just be obedient to what God is asking you to do, every breakthrough moment I've ever had in my life was a result of me just being obedient to what God was asking me to do. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I've never been disobedient to God and a breakthrough happened. <laughs> it, it, it's just being obedient. Can I encourage you today, just be obedient to God's voice. My mama told me like this, slow obedience, is no obedience. What's such a mom thing to say? It's true, just be, just be obedient. I love what Brother Young says. He says, we're not called to live by human reason. All that matters is obedience to God's word and his leading in our lives. If God says go, we'll go. If he says stay, we'll stay. When we are in his will, we are in the safest place in the world. I just wanna be in the will of God for my life. I just wanna be obedient. I just wanna go when he says go. I just wanna stay when he stays. Let's continue reading, verse 16. But he 
lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life, do not look back. Or stop anywhere in the valley, let's jump to verse 23. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew the cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But look at this, verse 26. But Lot's wife behind him did what? Look back and she became a pillar of salt. Today on Baptism Sunday, where we have over 100 people making a bold declaration that they're now Jesus followers, I wanna talk to you from this topic. Do not look back. If you're taking notes, I wanna talk to you from this topic. Don't, don't look back. Don't look back. I'm gonna pull the room for a moment. How many of you here come from a big family? Just a large family, you got a lot of siblings? Okay, how many of you have more than like five siblings? Seven siblings? Like nine? Okay, well, let me help you. Your parents had you for labor and that, that's, that's the purpose, that's, that's illegal. <laughs> they need to be arrested. Anything more than eight, it's like you're, you're breeding us to work for you. What are we doing here? Um, true story, I, I'm, I'm from a, I don't have an eight member family, but I got a six one. And uh, I'm, I got two older brothers, two younger brothers, and, and, and my youngest sister, Amberly. So kind of a big family. And uh, well, what I've noticed is, and you know this if you have siblings, every sibling has their role. So like as the younger sibling, it is my role, it's my obligation just to aggravate the devil out of my older sibling. And it's their job to beat the devil out of me. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then I go to my parents and then he gets, it's just, it's the cycle of life. Uh, I, my older brother, Christian, he is, he's an aggressive person by nature and, and uh, you know, went to the military, but he's just aggressive. He's just an aggressive, but he's preaching now. He loves Jesus. We're both pastors, so praise God. But so many stories that I could tell you. I could tell you, you know, I had my mouth wired shut when I was 22 because he broke my jaw. Just... I was in the hospital multiple times with a concussion. He's just, he's an aggressive lover. That's what he would tell you. <laughs> but one story in particular, I remember uh, I, was, I was 10 years old and, and uh, we, we went to an ice skaters game. How many remember ice skaters? The ice skaters, come on somebody. You kind of had to be there. If you weren't, you missed it. But uh, there was a time where every week in the Cajun Dome was like packed to capacity to see the ice skaters. It was like the thing. And, I remember uh, being 10 years old and, and, and we, go to this, we go to this ice gators game and my dad decided to get me this big green horn. How many remember that big, big green horn? Remember that, you get it? And I just decided that like that day, like all I was gonna do was just like blow it in his ear. Was like, that's what I was gonna do that day. I'm 10, I don't care about a hockey game. Like I'm, I'm bored, I wanna, I wanna annoy somebody. And uh, I remember we would get to the game and just, we're just five minutes in and he's watching the game and I just, you know, brrr, in his ear, he turns around, hey, just, can you not do that? And I waited and then I did it again. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, hey, seriously, don't do that. And, and then I did it again. And he said, if you do it again, I'm gonna murder you. <laughs> so I did it again and then, <laughs> and, uh, Boy, I'll tell you what, like, you know that rage, like when you go from a younger sibling to like, okay, he's actually gonna kill me now. So he turns around, grabs the horn. I start running for my life. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm sprinting, I'm running as fast as I can. Uh, at the time I'm 10, so he's 14 and, and he's, he's gonna kill me. So like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm running as fast as I can and, and about like 10 seconds into this sprint through the Cajun Dome, I turn around to see how far he is behind me. Well, the problem is, my body kept moving forward, but I was looking backwards at him, and, and, and when I turned back around, there was a glass vending machine about two inches from my face, and I went through the vending machine, and, and I'm a, I'll never forget this. I'm, I'm, I'm laying inside the vending machine. I went through it, so I have like snacks on me. I got like pretzels on me. My nose is broken. It's still crooked today with a scar, and uh, I, I'm just laying there, snacks, I'm bleeding. Just looking up, and I'll never forget him leaning over and going, yo, you good? 
I was like, yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm good. And he said, well, I swore he said this. I asked him about this yesterday. He said, do you remember this? He said, I remember this. He said, shouldn't have looked back. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> and here's the thought today. Here's the thought. As we're reading this story about Lot's wife looking back, we were never created to live this Christian life. Chris, okay, what you just saw today, just a bold stance, bold Jesus followers. This is who I am now. We were never created to live this Christian life looking back. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I, I experienced this tangibly. Uh, I, I remember like that being such a bold moment for me. And like I was coming to church and I, I joined a Bible study and, and, and I started bringing my friends to church. But at the same time, I was holding on to a toxic relationship that I knew was so unhealthy and it was just sinking me. And I would come to church and I'd sit in the seat that you're sitting in and I would worship and I'd be all in and God was just moving and like, like stuff, amazing stuff, like God stuff was happening in my life. But on the weekends, I was still going places that I knew just wasn't me. I like to say it like this. I felt like I was saved enough to go to heaven but not saved enough to stop going downtown. And I don't know, I just think like on Baptism Sunday, like I just wanna encourage somebody to let go of the past so you can actually lean forward into your future because here's what I know, how far you're able to go is based on what you're willing to leave behind. As we see in this story, if you refuse to close some doors of your past, even an angel cannot lead you to your destiny. And I don't know why God does the things that he does, but there are things that God will do for you and then there's things that you gotta do for yourself. And the Dr. Darius calls it cycles and seasons. He says, uh, seasons change regardless of you. Cycles don't change until you change. Yeah. And there are people here out of just an unhealthy cycle of your past. It's usually people, places, or things. Those are the cycles. Uh, until you let go of that, you're just gonna find yourself continuing to go, to go back. And this is what we see with Lot's wife. The Bible says in the scripture that we're reading that, that God in his goodness sends two angels to rescue their family from literally the city of sin. The Bible says that the angels are bringing them out. The city is on fire. And angels just say, don't do one thing. Just don't do one thing. Don't look, don't look back. And what does she does? Look here, Genesis 19, 23. It says, but Lot's wife behind him looked and became a pillar of salt. First time I read that, I just, I have like kind of like a wide margin Bible, which means there's space at the ends, and, and I often write questions. It's like God's not afraid of your questions, so if you read something you don't understand, just write it down, and, and, and I just have questions, and one of the questions was why? Why would, why would she look back? The, the city's on fire, it's a nothing but destruction, it represents nothing but like toxicity in this woman's life, and, and, and in a rescue mission, she stops to look back. I believe Lot's wife looked back because she had an inability to let go of her past. So now we read about Lot's wife. And because of her inability to let go of the past, she got stuck in a place that was only meant to be passed through. Woo. Simple message this morning, super simple. Here it is. There are people here who because of the pain of your past, you're stuck in a place that God never intended you to stay, right, never. And today in these next few moments, I, I wanna confront and conquer some of these things that keep us going back to our past, keep us looking back. Uh, as a pastor, I've sat in a lot of counseling sessions and it seems that, I don't wanna exaggerate, I'm not gonna say 100, but I'll go ahead and say 98% of all counseling sessions have to do with the two things we're gonna confront today. The first thing, if you're taking notes, these are two things in our past we need to let go of. The first one is regret, everybody say regret. You ever done something you regret, said something you regret? Nobody? Okay, well you just lied in church, so regret that. So you just. Uh, I, I asked my wife this week, I was like, babe, what's, what's like a story of something that I could do to regret? And she was like, gave me a list. I'm like, that's too much. She's like, use that, she used that as, as her opportunity to like, just don't criticize me. Um, regret. Man, I, I, remember, I remember last year, uh, Last year, I was, I was grocery shopping in an Albertsons, and, and as I was grocery shopping in this Albertsons, this, this, this woman, like I had my AirPods, and I was kind of going, this woman just kind of just kind of steps in front of my car, she says, hey, hey, and I said, hey, what's, what's going on? 
say, hey, you don't know me, but I, I just gotta tell you that. Sorry from the store, this is crazy. My husband and I just moved from Houston, Texas, and we're born and raised in Houston, and, and, and like we have a phenomenal church there. We, we, we love the church. We have to come here because of his job, and we literally have been praying. Our number one thing on our prayer list is help us find a great church. Like We have to have that. I've been praying. He's been praying. Uh, well, about three weeks ago, we were driving on East Broussard, and we saw the big silver cross. And I said, you know what? Let's just try out that church. She said, we came that Sunday, and, and your dad was greeting at the door, and my husband's Hispanic, and your dad started speaking to my husband in Spanish. I was like, no way, it's, it's crazy. And, and, and she said, yeah, and, and like we came in and then my kids love the student ministry and like the church is phenomenal. Like we love our Savior Church, y'all are amazing. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Like, you know, just humble, thank you, that's all God, but thank you so much, I appreciate it. And in the conversation, I'm just trying to make conversation here, I noticed that she was pregnant and I said, hey, just tell me, what are you having? How far along are you? And she said, uh, what are you talking about? What kind of monster am I? <laughs> this woman just poured out her heart to me in Super One Foods. And like, there's no coming back from that. You're already in. So it's like, maybe you didn't hear me. <laughs> I, just, I said, I was like, the, the, the pregnancy. She's like, I'm not pregnant. I'm like, you know, like she wouldn't, she, yeah, I was <laughs> Listen, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you could be nine months pregnant with triplets. If you don't tell me you're, you're pregnant, I'm like, you wanna go to kickboxing in the morning? <laughs> you, 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 what's up? You're like, what are you, what, what are you doing tomorrow? I got a yoga class. Just, oh my gosh, you're pregnant. I didn't even see the baby. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. You've made me a liar. You've done this to me. Regret, regret. You ever done anything you regret, said something you regret? It just, oh, yes, it just, Regret, man, I, I worked in uh, student ministry for years, served in student ministry, I loved it, it was amazing, and, and I feel like I've had so many conversations that are all the same with dads who usually are, are dealing with regret because they, they were not present in, 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 their, in their kids' lives, and now they're just overcome with guilt and shame. And, or maybe it's not that, maybe, maybe that's not it for you. Maybe it's something you said in your marriage or something you did in a relationship, and now because of regret, you're just overcome with guilt and shame. I wanna tell you something today. Uh, the Bible says that God has not given the enemy authority to see into your future. This is important because the greatest tool that he uses is guilt and shame. He, 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 he can't see into your future. The Bible says all he knows is your past. So what he does is he uses the guilt and shame of your past to beat you over the head in the present and in the process he robs you of the joy of your future. Yeah, like maybe you're here and you've just been holding on to guilt and shame and regret. Can I tell you there, I actually looked this up, 68 scriptures that talk about fixing your focus on the future. Yeah. Fixing your focus on what's in front of you. It's almost like God knew the people he would create were gonna deal with regret. So he just over and over and over emphasized this importance of getting that guilt and shame off of you. Scriptures like Philippians 3.13. It says, I focus on one thing, Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Oh, how, how different would your year be if you said, this year, I'm forgetting the past. Like this year, I'm actually just gonna focus on what's ahead of me this year. What are you doing this year? Focusing on what's ahead of me. How different would your year be if you were just intentional about, um, I'm intentional about that guilt and shame. That might be what I did, but it's not who I am anymore. Now I'm focusing on, on what's ahead. Look at scriptures like Isaiah 43, 18. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I wanna to talk to some like seasoned people in the house, because oftentimes when you hear pastors talking about new things, you think God only does new things in young people. Do you know that even if you're here and you're seasoned, that God wants to do a new thing in your life? that the best is ahead, that the enemy tells you that the best days are behind you, it's actually not true. You can make significant impact in the fourth quarter of your life. God wants to do a, a new thing in your life. Life. I'll tell you, there are people here who, if I could just be honest, you just need to like forgive yourself. Yeah. Why? Because God has already forgiven you. Yeah. 
you know, almost all the counseling sessions I'm in, the issue is never that God hasn't forgiven you. The issue is always that you haven't forgiven yourself. Always. It's where the scriptures like 1 John 1, 7, where it says, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from, say this, all sin. All sin. Not like just a socially acceptable sin. I deal with anger, that's my sin. Everybody deals with anger. I'm talking about the thing that you're so ashamed of. Jesus' blood covers that sin. You know the biggest lie that all of us believe is that if we're fully known, we can't be truly loved. Can I tell you that God fully knows you and truly loves you and his blood has covered your past, present, and future sin? Look at scriptures like Micah 7, 19. Your sin is casted into a sea of what? Forgetfulness. I love the language that scripture uses. Forgetfulness. You ever met someone that like had memory issues? They couldn't, like, God chooses to have memory issues about your sin the moment you ask for forgiveness. It's gone. It's gone. I don't remember it. What are you talking about? Here, here I am, God, coming to you because I'm feeling overwhelmed with what I repented for three months ago. I have no clue what you're talking about. Also, I'm just holding on to this. <laughs> Corey, can you, can you catch? Okay, you, you sit there. I want you to see this. If, if, you're, if you're a visual learner, this, I, I, want to, I, want this, I want this to help you today. Could you imagine if I sold Corey my truck? Corey gives me money for my truck. Pays me, I give him the keys, I take the title out, I sign my name, he signs his name, we go to a notary, we stamp it, it's now Corey's truck, belongs to him. Could you imagine if in two years I show up with a spare key? I get in the truck and, and I start it and I leave. What would that be? Stealing. Why? Because it no longer belongs to me. Shame is when you go back and you try accessing something that legally no longer even belongs to you. Yeah, I just want to encourage you. If you're here and you're dealing with guilt, shame, regret, put the past behind you. Focus on what's ahead. Every day, remind yourself that you've been washed in the blood of Jesus and his blood is powerful enough for your past, present, and future sin. That shouldn't be a grace pass to do whatever you want. That should make you wanna get on your hands and knees and say, dear God, what a good God I serve. If you're not gonna be stuck looking back like Lot's wife, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta overcome regret. The second thing you gotta do is, is, is you gotta overcome some wounds. Now this is important, I want you to see the difference. Regret is something that has happened because of us. I did something in my marriage or didn't do something in my marriage. I said something as a father or I didn't say something I should have said as a father. That's, that happened because of me. Wounds are something that's happened to me. I've had nothing to do with this wound. Maybe you're a young person here and, 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 and your wound is your father left, so now you feel like, like you just got this weird vacant void. It's like this doesn't feel right. It's just because it was never supposed to be that way. That's a wound. Maybe you're here and, and the wound is, uh, uh, it was an abuse thing. Maybe when you were younger, someone abused you and it had nothing to do with you. You didn't choose it, it chose you. That's a, that's a wound. I was in a counseling session about six months ago, and uh, th this couple came in, and they, they were in their mid-40s, and, and as soon as they came in, the wife sat down, and she just, she started going in. She, she said, Pastor, he keeps leaving us. I said, I said well, what do you mean? She said, every time we get into a fight about anything, whether it's, it's small as taking out the trash or whether it's something big, he gets in his truck and actually leaves. I don't know where he is for like an hour, and now the kids are getting older. They have four kids. They're getting older, and now they're starting to ask questions. Why, why, do you keep, why do you keep leaving? And, and he's just sitting there, arms crossed, just stone cold, just giving nothing. I, I, I said, um, hey, sir, you, you wanna share anything? He's like, no, I'm good. So I, I said, okay, well, well, ma'am, can you step out so I can just talk to him? Because now I'm thinking maybe this is like an infidelity thing. Maybe there's something going on on the side and he's just not gonna open up. And, and she leaves the room. And the moment she leaves the room, he starts breaking down crying like, like a child. And he says, Pastor, she will never know what I went through growing up. I said, what do you mean? He said, my mom got remarried when I was three years old and my stepdad beat me. 
beat me. I had to go to three different schools because I would show up with black eyes and they wouldn't let us go to the school anymore. He beat me from the time I was three to 10, but I discovered something when I was 10 years old. Whenever he got angry or mad, if I would just leave for a while, if I would just go to my neighbor's house for a couple of hours, he would either forget or his anger would just simmer down and I could come back and everything was good. And you know, I had this revelation looking at this 45-year-old man weeping in front of me in this counseling room. I realized that because of wounds in your life, you may grow old, but you never really grow up. And although he was a 45-year-old grown man, inside there was a 10-year-old broken little wounded boy. Maybe you're here today and, and, and you have some wounds in your life and, and although you've grown old, truthfully, you haven't really grown up. Maybe internally you're that 12-year-old wounded girl, that's when your dad left. And you've never really grown past that place of wounding. Maybe that's not it for you. Maybe, maybe you're older and, and, and it's a different situation. I have a scripture for you because I wanna encourage you in Psalms 147.3. The Bible says that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Who does that? A counselor, a therapist, a TED talk, a help. He, he, if you're here today and you have wounds, I got good news for you. The healer's in the room this morning. And there's healing accessible for you today. Yeah. You know, when you read the Bible, you see, God has several different names. We see Adonai, which means Lord or Master. We see Jehovah Jireh, which means God will provide. Oh, but my favorite is Jehovah Rapha. That's the God who heals. I just feel led to share my story this morning. Um, If you don't know me, I, I grew up in church. My pastor's kid, PK, and, and uh, my life was this. You know, Monday, prayer meeting, Tuesday, worship meeting, Wednesday, midweek service, Thursday was just, our, our life was growing up in church, you know. You know the pastor's kid thing, you get saved eight times, baptized nine times. On the ninth time, they hold you down so long that you think you see Jesus. <laughs> That's my story. I was raised in this, raised in church, I did that. And then when I was 26, my entire life, I flipped upside down. It started off just like any other day. Me and my younger brother, Wesley, we were working at my grandmother's furniture store and, and, and I went to walk-ons with a buddy and, and he, went, he went to a friend's house and at about nine o'clock I was walking out of the walk-ons. When I was walking out of the walk-ons, there was a big crowd in the street and I'll, I will never forget just kind of walking up, kind of seeing what the crowd was allowed. It was like 50 people and as I walked up, the crowd parted and there was a guy that turned around and said, he's dead. And as I got closer, I saw my 21-year-old brother laying on the ground who, who got hit by, by a car. He was on his motorcycle. He died on impact. And I will never forget feeling so deeply disappointed with God. Wound. I didn't choose this. This chose me. For the first time in my life, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with God. I really stopped coming to church. I, I, stopped, I, stopped, I stopped reading my Bible. I, I, I stepped away. I didn't want anything to do with it. This was like, this was the first time that something happened contrary to this, like, God has a purpose and a plan and he loves you and he just wants you to be good. Like that, like that, it was just, it was too much pain for me. I stepped away for a year. I'd always partied. I was always going downtown, but I really went all in. I was just numbing. Turned to substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, relationship after relationship. I was numb and really I was just, I was just trying to fill myself, I was just trying to fill something. About a year into this process, I got a text from a 760 number, and it said, hey, I know you don't know me, my name's Obed Martinez, and I'm, I'm preaching at your dad's church, and it, I'd really like you to come. I, I never met him, I never heard him preach, never heard of his name, but I was at a place that I hope some of you find yourself today. I tried every high, and it never worked tried every relationship, that didn't work. I tried every substance and it always left me feeling empty. And he just caught me at a good moment. 
I showed up to church that day on a Wednesday night at a spiritual renewal in a room more packed than this. And he preached a message that I'll never forget called, you can still get there on broken pieces. The first time in my life I had the revelation that me having a relationship with God didn't require me having it all together first and then coming to him. It's not even Christianity. Christianity is not get cleaned up and then go to Jesus. It's you go to Jesus, he cleans you up. This is not behavior modification. It's radical life transformation. That only happens through the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus. I responded to the altar call. I I just like, craziest thing. Like, literally, I wish you could see it. He, he, he didn't even like have an, like he, was, he just prayed. Like as he was praying, I just, I just like came up to the altar and it was him and me. Like it would, be, it would be like if Corey came to the altor and 2,000 people were here and he just got on his knees, just me and him, 2,000 people watching. And he just began to speak life over me. Begin to remind me that, that I'm not my past, that today is a fresh start. Today, everything changes. Not because of who I am, but because of what Jesus did. The only way I can explain it is when I got off my knees at that altar call, I've never looked back. I don't know why, I don't know why my brother passed away 21, so young, so much life, I don't know. And hear me when I say this statement, and I I, I don't wanna, this is just, I don't know, I just, I just think there'll be moments in life where God will allow, I don't know, suffering wounds. It's like, it's like he's the only person that can take a mess and just turn it into a miracle. He's the only person that just taken the, the jacked up, broken pieces of your life to say, how in the world does this have purpose? Breathes in it. And then you look back 10 years later and say, had it not been for that, I wouldn't be here today. I don't know where you find yourself at today, but can I encourage you to make this your moment? Take this the moment to where you say, I don't understand it, but I'm gonna surrender it. Because he's the God that still makes broken things beautiful. He's the God that still takes the worst moments of your life and says, if you can surrender him to me, seven years later, you'll be standing on the stage where the casket where your brother was buried and you'll be preaching about hope. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, I believe there's two groups of people here. I believe the first group is saying, Pastor, you're talking about regret? (laughs) That's me. You have no clue the regret that I have. And now I'm just overcome with guilt and shame. Things that I've done that nobody knows that I've just been holding on to, and I feel like I can't hold on to it any longer. Like, I'm serious. It's gotten to a place where I feel like if I hold on to it any longer, I can't hold on to it, it's gonna have a hold of me. And my, and my identity is gonna be this wound. Can I go back to the beginning of my message today and ask you to just be obedient? You don't have to understand. I don't understand. But I do understand the word surrender. And I do understand that he paid the ultimate price for me. So I'm gonna just surrender it to him. And I wanna invite you to do that today. If you're here, you've been dealing with regret. Maybe it's not regret, maybe it's a wound. When you were young, your father left and it's jacked you up. Maybe it was an abuse thing, and now you've had to try to find identity by doing things that you're ashamed of. Wounds. If you're here today, and you've been carrying regrets, guilt, shame, wounds, it's just been on you, and you're saying, Pastor, I cannot walk out of this place the way I walked in. I wanna give you an opportunity to surrender this thing, just to surrender it. On the count of three, if that's you, every head bowed, every eyes closed, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. One, this is your moment. Two, the time is now three. If that's you, raise that hand high. You're gonna get some freedom in this place today. Hands up all over the room, from side to side, too many to count. Father, I thank you that the God that raises dead things back to life is still doing it today. The healer who would walk into villages and put his hands on sickness and healing would happen. It's happening right now. 
marriages on the end that it felt like this is too far broken, healing right now. When you were young and you got abused and you've just been holding it, healing right now. You've been so tired of doing it on your own. You just like just trying to push through and it's just like, I just feel like I'm just like every day is a fight. Healing right now. God fully knows you and because he fully knows you, he fully loves you. And no longer will you walk out of this place feeling broken, feeling less than, feeling insufficient. I thank you that today we find 100% of our identity in you and you alone. And from that place, we'll walk out of here with our head up, feeling whole, feeling restored. There's a second group here. As you put down your hands, the second group is saying, Pastor, I hear you talking about Jesus, but I do not have a relationship with Jesus. I've done religion. I, I've shown up to church just to check the box. I've, I've sat down, stood up, twirled three times. I know that, but a personal relationship, that's foreign to me. I don't know anything of what you're talking about. If that's you, I have some news for you. This is simple, but this is heavy. Just like, let this hit you. God loves you. He loves the real you. When you go home and you put your phone down, you get off social media and you put your head on the pillow and it's just you and you, God loves that person. He's been waiting for you. In the moments where you felt like you've been alone, you've never been alone for a moment. And today, this is your opportunity. On the count of three with every head bowed, every eyes closed, if you're saying, Pastor, I wanna have a personal relationship with Jesus. This is not uh, being Christian. This is not being baptized or joining the church. This only happens once. This is being born again, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, this is your moment. Two, the time is now. Three, if that's you, you want a personal relationship with Jesus. Come on, raise them high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, I see you in the back, 30. You can put your hands down. Church family, can we pray this prayer together with those that just made this decision? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God.